What up, y'all? It's Arthur D. Austin, better known as Choke No Joke. But we out here at the legendary Tunnel Nightclub, or at least where it used to be. Everybody asks me, what's the Tunnel? The Tunnel was a nightclub that was owned in the 90s here by Peter Gation. In 94, Stress Entertainment started a party called Mecca. In 96, Franchise Entertainment took it over, and they had it until it closed. All the biggest names in hip hop perform here, from Jay-Z, Meth and Red, Dr. Dre, Snoop, Nas, Puff Daddy and the family, Eve, you name it, they was all here. If you had heart, you came here. But everybody didn't have heart. So it's time for y'all to enter the club most people feared to enter, the tunnel. The tunnel wasn't a unique hip hop club and its foundations were based on the concept of bringing hip hop from all the boroughs to one location. And it was the brainchild of Peter Gation. My name is Sterling Cox. I was the head of security. Alpha Green in Brooklyn, New York. My name is V. House. Sincere from Brooklyn. Glenn Beck. Jumping Lee, whatever Lee you want to call me. The Mega. Ray Mack. Diamond. Craig. Candy. Big Box. Big Country. Ramona Diaz. Big Penner. Big CB, John Bass Raleigh, Sean Brophy, sound engineer, DJ Johnny Walker Red, MC Frank Jigger, the celebrity's choice, Choke No Joke, legendary videographer, Supreme Bigger Figure, Big Cap, The War in, Big G, AKA the ringleader. The tunnel was a hip hop nucleus. It was the epicenter. It was the domain, the temple. It was the mecca. It was like the hip hop Woodstock. Nothing was that melting pot of hip hop. They kept the paradigm going. It's almost like what Rucka did for, for like street basketball. The tunnel was that of music industry. Hip hop had a heart. That shit was one of the main arteries. It was actually a mecca. That's what the original name of the party was, mecca. It was like a time machine. That's how the tunnel was. You came out a whole different individual. We went in there young men with attitudes and came out there wiser men with our lives. It was definitely a starting beginning spot for artists to come and mingle and branch out and get your record heard and get your your shit together really to go into the next phrase of your career. The tunnel was not open or did not open. A lot of new artists or a lot of artists that we know now this very day will have never been known. All these artists out today need to be happy that the tunnel was fucking open. Nobody would hear none of y'all singing tight pants niggas right now. The tunnel was a platform for niggas like Jay and Puff, Woo and Mob and DMX and Rough Riders. Niggas don't respect these niggas today, man. You need to realize, man, without them niggas, man, and their platform, it made a lot of moves for niggas today. It happened there, it made it relevant. It became a pillar of hip hop. The tunnel is the nucleus of hip hop and I'll say all the way down south because when the tunnel was open, wasn't too much going on down that motherfucker. Y'all can say what y'all want, east of the south, but New York made the shit pop. New York was where it's at. The tunnel in New York is where you needed to be to pop. The tunnel was definitely a hip hop nucleus, yo. It was just like the galaxy, it bring other planets in. You have people from France, Germany, London, everywhere we like. If they came to New York, they had to go to the tunnel. Hi, Premier, I come here to meet you, and I, I'm going to every other place. I'm going to the Bronx, to Cedric Avenue, with Hoo Hook, do the party, and Cedar, and then I'm going to the tunnel. It was our barometer for, you know, how we were really gauging records, and we were really you know, studying the behavior of the consumer. Saying it ain't just like how they do it now. You could just throw a record out and, you know what I'm saying, wait eight weeks, 10 weeks, whatever, for the shit to bubble. Niggas was putting them records on to see if them shits get that reaction. And if the shit was popping, niggas would fast track it. If it wasn't, niggas would go back to the drawing board. Absolutely, it's the definition of hip hop nucleus. Everything was there. Everything that surrounded hip hop, from fashion to music, 
hairstyles. Like it encompassed every part of the hip hop experience and they put it all in one building on a Sunday night. If you go as far back to little hole in the walls and little, you know, senses where people start elaborating, playing the sounds and displaying the, the culture to if and later on you have places that was up in Harlem, like Harlem World, or up in the Bronx called Tea Connection, just using them as an example, or many other places all throughout the city. And then years later, here come places like Union Square and Latin Quarters. The last of the Mohegans of for real hip hop had became the Tunnel. Tunnel was definitely a hip hop nucleus, it really was. And you gotta say, believe it or not, the wagon master was a one-eyed white guy from Canada, Peter Gation. Nothing will ever be like the Tunnel. There ain't gonna never be another tunnel, B. What the tunnel did for artists like the Puffs and the JDs and the Jay-Zs of the world is solidify their street music. Man, gave them full-fledged legitimacy. It, it, it's almost like uh, getting a star on the Walk of Fame in L.A. Tunnel made you official. If you came to the tunnel and you performed at the tunnel, you were official. What the tunnel did for artists, it helped brand them become who they are. The tunnel rebirthed the life of these people, shaped and molded them to become who they are today. That gave us a platform, set up Rough Riders, Rockefeller, uh, Bad Boy, slew of other artists. You may have everybody throughout the city say, oh yeah, that's the tunnel. But if you go out of New York and you go somewhere across the country or across overseas, oh, you was at the tunnel? That's how much an impact that club had. The tunnel for artists like Jay and Diddy and Capone and Noriega and Nas, it, it was an outlet to their music to the streets. It gave a lot of artists what notoriety, I would say. All they favor was brung to the street like that. Put them on the map. It brought them to an enormous height, which they wouldn't have got any other club. If you wanted to get New York behind you, you knew that you had to come to that tunnel. That's one thing Jay-Z knew. He knew that's where New York was, where the hip hop was, was in that tunnel. Nas knew that. Snoop and Dre, they knew, nah, the tunnel was where it's at. Master P, he knew that. Timberland knew that. Baby knew that. You know how good it is to go to a spot like the tunnel and seeing them rocking in your music? Like, you know what I'm saying? You know what that meant? That meant you were solidified. That's why all those labels and everything, Def Jam, Elektra, Capital, they was coming, they was sending those reps every week with records. Because they knew if their record got played in the tunnel, they had something going. Because not only hood niggas was partying in tunnels, like it was, it was definitely a heavy presence of record execs and, and people with money that was really in there, that was in position to do things for artists. If they asked you to motherfucking perform, that means you was that nigga. You feel like how Nino and them was coming through in New Jack City, you know what I'm saying? You remember when they came through in New Jack City? When you saw my Tony, you had that feeling. It was that. A lot of their songs that you wouldn't hear on the radio because of the profanity in them would get played at the tunnel. The tunnel was the outlet for the streets. It was a great vehicle to break street records. It brought you closer to the people that were gonna support you. I feel as though what the tunnel did for artists like me and all the other artists in the naughty 90s was put a platform where you didn't have to go to the garden. The tunnel was training for a lot of artists. To me, it was like a, a boot camp. It showed their mobility of handling the crowd and their performance ability. So the tunnel actually molded these artists that's here now that's gravitating these big venues. And it was like the Apollo. If you were not good, <laughs> you're not good. You had to entertain that crowd. And if you were able to entertain that crowd, it's the future, which, they, which it is because they're now. The tunnel molded Jay-Z. The tunnel molded Jim Jones, who was a hype man for Cameron. The tunnel molded Cameron. The tunnel keep Black Moon in business right now, Evil D. Dallas producers would just leave the tunnel at an early time and go home and make beats. What it did for us, it just kept all of us grounded. I could definitely say the tunnel made a lot of them artists millionaires. You performed in the tunnel, you knew that you had the heart of New York. And if you rock the tunnel, you're gonna blast off. As I step up in the place at a slow pace, Looking real lace with my celly to the face. Watch out for the sewage. Yeah. I was like, damn, I'm like, 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 I'm
even though the entrance to the tunnel is on 27th Street and 12th Avenue, the entry really started on 11th Avenue, that, that long block, because that's where we started stopping everybody. You are not fly if they didn't know you to let open up the banister and let you drive and park on the block. It wasn't important. You had to wait about three blocks to get in the motherfucker. It was about 3,000 people on line. The line is just so astronomically long. Once you make your travel trip up the block, you have to get on this long gate. Everybody about to go get on this line. Like we about to go up in the tunnel. Your name is? Liz. Where you from? I'm Dominican and Cuban. What borough you represent? Uptown, Harlem World. Oh, oops, Harlem <laughs> World today. So I remember getting out the car and you know what I'm saying, walking down the long alley, like, man, hold up, cuz, where we going? Like, this ain't no club, you know what I'm saying? Usually, first 500 women are free, and when I got to work, the line was on the block, and sometimes people were standing on cars and already rioting, wanting to get in for free. But once you got to that gate and it was trapped off, you had ID, you was good to come in. You didn't have that ID, you had to grease somebody to get through that gate. My man used to be at the top of the, the, top of the block up there. He used to be charging cats $10 just to get on the line, and they used to pay it. You ain't know the homie that was running it, or they ain't know you, somebody ain't know you, big top flight security and all the diesel brothers and us that was out there then more than likely, nine times out of 10, you was getting played. By the time you get, up, you know, in the club, you might be down a hundred already. I don't know, just to get in, you, it seemed like you had to be thorough. Make sure you cut that line, get to the front. Me and Jim used to always run up to the front of the door and just Debo our way through. Fuck a line, fuck 11th Avenue with the bike racks and We came down 28th Street, around the back to the West Side Highway, yeah. right in it. Paul, you, over here, nigga. The guys lined up along 27th Street, and the guys' line was always the longest line, and it was like hours before they got to the front door, and the ladies lined up along the West Side Highway. So if you came with your boys and you came with girls, it's no telling everybody got in or not. You know what I'm saying? And remember back then, everybody ain't had cell phones. We outside the tunnel, and we about to go inside in like five seconds. You know what I'm saying? You started from 11th Avenue. That was a security check. ID, please. Then you had to get online. The gates was actually the first ID check. ID. Got down to the middle of the block was another security check. And then you had to get to the door. Was another ID check. ID. And then you had to get to the stairs. ID. It was various channels to get into the door. And you'd have to walk up into the club and be searched. At one point, it was all one search area, male and females in one area. And eventually they decided, well, let's just cut that up and put the girls in one side and the guys in another. The search procedures was no other. We did actually search you very tightly. Them searches was the worst searches ever. The search was sheer disrespect. They was doing in the tunnel what the airport security does now. Search at the tunnel was like Rikers Island search. Rikers. Rikers Island. It was like going into the penile and penitentiary, yo. You had to check in at the door, you get frisked down, get your clothes to go in, and you stepping in with a whole bunch of motherfuckers you ain't never seen before and shit. So you gotta get your corner, and you gotta get your back turned to the shit so if it pop down, you ready to get it in because you feel like you're in a motherfucking yard with a, with a big ass system playing. So the minute they walked in there, you had Big Rob saying, we're gonna search you down, we find any type of weapon, we're gonna kick your ass and dump you in the dumpster. Took these jackets off, kicked off their boots, you know, sometimes even the socks. First time I ever heard of take your shoes off, open your mouth, was in the tunnel. It was damn near anything but a full cavity search and shit. Cause niggas back then, they were spitting razors and shit. So they be I like, open your mouth. Take, grab the boost, bang them, bang, hit them on the ground, just like they do on the island. Make sure they ain't got no knives and razors up in there. If you got dreads, you gotta shake out your dreads. They check you, check the soles of your feet, give you a nut check, check under your collar. They did everything but made you squat. It really reminded me when I used to go to the island. <laughs> to see see my loved ones. And I don't care how well you hid your contraband, they will find it. We used to catch all sorts of stuff up coming up through that search area, man. Guns, knives, dope, coke. Motherfucking bouncers used to be trying to find any and everything. Not to find it, not to include everything they were trying to put in their pocket on the side. You know, them type of niggas that go search you, find 20, you know what I'm saying? Find something dirty, tell you, yo, my nigga, you gotta fix me up. And let you go in with it regardless. You feel me? You know how that go. You can always pay for the tunnel security. I had a searcher, I won't say his name. He'll know once he sees this video. And he would have a box 
in the middle of the search area. So all the weed that was confiscated was to go into that box. So during the course of the night, I would walk by and talk about weed. My God, we're talking about a, a box half full of weed. Now the cops have a habit of walking in the building all the time and say, Sterling, man, this place smells like weed. I said, that's impossible. There's no, no one even smokes inside here. You know, it smells like unsmoked weed. Like you, got a, like a, you got a plantation of weed in here. Not knowing that this mook got a box full of weed right over there. I'm walking the cops right by it. Right? I'm like, what the fuck? What, the, what are you doing, bro? When I found out, I, 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 was so, I fired him. Dude, go, that's not my, I'm not even saying something. I'm not, that's not me. I'm not, I'm not telling them to put it in there. They put it in there. I said, where does it go at the end of the night? Where does it go? I used to get everybody's weed. They would put it on the table right there, me and the homies. I never had to bring weed to the club, <laughs> to be honest with you. So yeah, shout out to Tunnel Security. So we're searching. I'm searching the kid, search his boots or whatever he had on, sneakers. I search his body. I said, OK, I got to go through your bag. So he goes, OK. He opens up his bag. And when I did this, the other guys that were behind the, 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 the magnometers, they, they were all like this. Like, they all just sort of leaned forward like, like, yo, what's up? It was, it, in there was money. We're not talking about one stack of money. We're talking about stacks. And st he had to have, what I thought back then might have been 30,000, was probably closer to 60. That's a guess. It was all in there in cash. I said, look, I got to stick my hand. I, I realized what, what was up, and I had to stick my hand in there and search around, make sure there wasn't, it was nothing but fucking cash. And they had the skinniest kid wearing the bag, like in the front, you know, like in the front of him. Now again, I'm not robbing nobody, it's not my thing. But I'll tell you what, considering all the security there was 99% black, I wish that one day in my whole life I was black. Because, because if I had the option, and, and not because I want to be black, but because then he wouldn't have noticed me choking him out from behind. I'd, I'd had somebody start a riot, and choked the kid. He'd have disappeared into the crowd with me, the bag would have been gone, and I'd have showed up next Sunday like it all was good. It was the regular person search, which was like a full body prison cavity search. And then it was like the, like the celebrity search, which was a high five, a pound, go ahead. A uh, funny story about that, me and Red Man, we, we worked out together in the same Fifth Avenue gym. So I'm like, you know, Reggie. He came in with meth and the whole Wu-Tang posse one night. And, you know, I'm like, you know, and Sterling was standing like right, right next to me, like over there, he could hear. And I'm like, Red, yeah, well, what's good, Reggie? And I gave him a pound, let him slide by. Method Man stepped up to me and I went to search him. He's like, and he was like mad loud, yo, you ain't search Reggie. And I'm like, shut up, man. <laughs> I'm like, and I don't, I don't front like, you know, like I know, I'm like, I know who you are, but I don't know you like that. I know him like that, but I don't know you like that. So I flipped open his jacket, he had mad duchess in there, and I'm like, yo, hold that down. And he was like, oh yeah, you know, he thought I was the coolest person that night. New York has always been notorious for that. Like, you from Eden Wall, there's a nigga that works the door, you good. You can come in with a fucking Uzi, and niggas wouldn't say nothing to you. But if you wasn't from, and if that nigga was doing the door and you wasn't from Eden Wall, he about to take off your shoes, take off your socks, Pull your pants down, pull your shirt up. And there was girls that I, I said, I can't search her, she peed on herself. She was like, it was cold outside. I said, you still coming in? And we were like, no, you gotta go home. And she didn't, she went right inside, she went into the water and she put it in the dryer and she kept on partying. The girls used to have to come in, they used to have to remove their shoes. I mean, they wanted to go through your purse and everything or whatever, but I just really didn't like take up my shoes. That was the thing that I just really just didn't like. You know, they said we searched them worse than going to Rikers. They didn't have to have that much uh, cavity searching. Um, when we searched, we had to put our hand because you could tell the difference when they're walking, they will roll up whatever they had to roll up and put it in their pads. So there were incidents and times that they give knives and stuff to their partners that are waiting inside. So we will let them know that before we were going to search that if they don't feel comfortable with it, that they could go ahead and leave. And they were like, go ahead. But this one particular female, they pulled it out and it was time in the camera. It was, which is crazy, like they check everything, but you still get it through. The entry to the tunnel was worse than entering the courtroom, only for the fact of a safety purpose. But you knew that once you gained access into that building, there's a glorifiable night that you will never forget. Tunnel security, was the realest group 
of security officer I've ever seen in my life. At that time, and still probably to this day, was the best security in the world. I miss it. I miss them brothers. Some are still here, some are gone. We had the best security force in America. Felt like Vegas security. And they is like correction officers. I can remember one thing. In a word, they were big. Just imagine like a village of Shreks. It always looked like they were like gorillas. Solid, scary looking. Big, black, mean dudes. I couldn't stand them for a while. They was extra a whole lot, but you needed it because you had you had gangsters coming from all over. They was like the police for the, for the thugs and the gangsters inside the club. Tunnel security, they, Obama should have them. I would always say the tunnel security is number one best. All the best in the whole city. I was in Cancun and, and somebody said, yo, you from the tunnel, dog? I said, yeah, yeah, we, we were known worldwide. Well, I've been everywhere in the world, man. I ain't never seen the security like how the tunnel security. We ain't take no shit off of nobody. They had a room in the tunnel in the back and they used to have weights and, and punching bags and everything. And they, they used to go in there and stretch and do karate sparring matches before, before they come out. Every time I'd come in at 5.30, they were suiting up in the hallway and they were putting on shields on their arms and their legs. So everybody had their little trick of what they were gonna use for the night. And I used to be like, is there a reason why y'all doing that? A few of them was like, yeah, we gotta whip a nigga ass tonight. They pretty much rolled in packs of 10. One radio with 10 guys, and they would just circle the whole place and, you know, try to keep peace where they could. You had to learn to be on their good side. Certain niggas used to run down on you. They see you smoking. They try to tell you, give me $20 or some shit like that. But you give them that shit and get, them, get the fuck out of here. You smoking all night. I mean, that was our hustle. We, <laughs> we used to tax dudes, you know, you smoking, you wanna smoke weed in that corner. You know, you gotta pay for that. It was a lot of security in there that overdid their job sometimes, but overall, it was cool. Soon as a fight broke out, you might get two, three hits. They were coming in a line. And if you wasn't looking when that line came, it was gonna run you over. They beat you up first, and then they ask questions later. They would just hem people up, have you out the door. They'll lift you straight the fuck up. They wouldn't throw you out, they'd bounce you out. They love knocking niggas out, yo. <laughs> they loved it. No, we had to put our paws on niggas. That, that was part of the game. If one got into a fight, you better believe you was getting your ass whipped by that whole side of the tunnel. That was a place where you come and you know you couldn't act up, because you act up, you're going out one way or another. I've seen dudes seven foot tall, 500 pounds, go to my boss talking about, yo, you can keep that bread for the night. I can't have no parts of this. I'm out of here, because they were soft like that. Nowadays, you can take a test, and anybody can get certified. You couldn't get certified in that building taking that type of test. There's only one test you had to pass up in that building. Certification, hands on. It could be a fight amongst 20 people. Security's gonna get in that fight. You just see giants coming everywhere, every angle. And some of them motherfuckers had guns. The leader of the pack behind Sterling, because he was the head security, he would have a four pound out. And then on the way out, they gonna rough you up and break you up and rob you and take your chain <laughs> and your money and your ID and then toss you off these four steps. They was quick fast to catch you fighting or drunk. Once you drunk, that was straight payday. When they throw you out, your wallet gone, everything gone. Your motherfucking coat gone. It'll be wintertime, nigga. You freezing, fucked up, drunk. They took my coat. They talking about what you talking about. You had your shit. Absolutely. And if you make, and you know what's crazy about tunnel security now? If you see them same dudes and interview them, they would tell you that they used to rob niggas back in the day. 100%. 100%. Were people getting robbed at the tunnel by security? Allegedly. <laughs> well, you know, I plead the fifth, you know what I mean? <laughs> I ain't gonna say, but you know, it, 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 you know what I mean? I honestly, man, the security was some good dudes, man. If a nigga said he got robbed, he was doing wrong. You got in a problem in the tunnel, your fucking arms got stretched like this, nigga put you in the yoke, and, and they just, went in your pockets. <laughs> niggas took your watch, your rings. Trust me, all it, that. It definitely happened to my mans and when we got into a couple fights. It never happened to me, probably because we had the face, but my mans definitely was like, yo, them niggas went in my pockets. Could have been while they were getting, you know, roughed up, they dropped something here and there, you know, usually happens. All together, I think it was like 80 of us. 
out of that 80, maybe it was like 10. Just like anything else, if you got a law firm, you got one or two bad lawyers. If you got a, if you got a precinct, you got one or two bad cops. It's not the whole precinct. My son went home with a lot of stuff. You know, he went to school with a lot of different things. You know what I mean? I ain't saying I took nothing. The niggas gaffle game is crazy. Straight Brooklyn. Niggas stop the fight, break the fight up, in the nigga pocket at the same time. Nigga chain off a of nigga chain at the same time. Next thing you know, they, they breaking the fight up and them niggas spinning on you like this with your shit in their pocket, spinning right back. You heard? Fight is over. It's like, cut it out! They going in your pocket. Y'all bring it up! Y'all bring it up! They going in their pockets and shit. As they're bringing him out the club, they popping his chain off, they going, they digging his pockets, taking his wallet. So by the time he get to the door of the club, he got one shoe on, his chain is gone, his wallet's gone, he got rabbit ears, and it's four degrees outside. That basically what would happen. So, you know, you run, you run in your mouth, you get fucked up, you wake up, your shit's gone. Who took your shit? I don't know. I ain't even mad at them, because if, if I was the security nigga out there busting my ass in the heat or in the cold out there for $100 or $120, whatever they was getting at night, you know what I'm saying? I'm already out here, but nigga, now you fronting, you drunk, and we got to throw you out? You're not leaving with that. Tough guys is in there. Everybody's popping off. Everybody's talking crazy. You pop off. Yo, by the time you leaving, you don't leave the same piece you came in with. You know what I'm saying? Or you, you fall apart by the time you get to the front door. Because it's all there's a lot of I'm going to kill you and wait till I see you again and you dead and whatever, whatever, whatever. So, yo, guys left. Not necessarily all in one piece. A lot of dudes used to come in here on their rah-rah thinking security was soft. Now, as a man, if you're going to test a man, certain men, they're not going to go for the bullshit. If you're going to run up on somebody thinking you tough and you're going to come into their domain, what you think going to happen? If I come in your domain and I play tough guy and you got a bunch of tough guys with you, what's supposed to happen to me? So what was supposed to happen, happened. You got washed, you got washed. You took a loss, you took a loss. So if you wasn't tough enough to handle it, B, you ain't belong there. And if you ain't belong there, it showed very quickly. You had that chain out, that shit was leaving with one of them niggas that night. The chain is like a magnet to their head. Seriously, if they came in with big chains, they would get robbed. I don't want to say this artist's name, but this artist came in, big mouth, running it like I'm this, that, and the other. Around 20 minutes later, he comes to the front door. Hey, look, one of your security just robbed me. Yo, man, they took my chain. They took my chain. Well, how do you know he was my security? So they start talking, you know, he looked like this and this and this. I said, who took your chain, bro? The niggas inside took my chain. I said, all right, come inside. Show me who took your chain. So they start walking all around through the club, and, and the guy's scared. He's like, you know, that's him. Not like, that's him. And more like, yo, yeah, that's, you know, that's the guy. <laughs> I go, dude, it ain't those guys. Those guys are curious. They're the man, that nigga got my chain. So he's like, yo, you robbed my fucking friend? And he's like, no, 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 no. I, I mean, what you talking about? I ain't never, no, no, no. Yes, you did, yes, you did. He goes, no, I mean, come on, man. I mean, I mean, what, you want it back? Open your jacket. They got several chains. Yo, show me which is yours, and I'll give it back to you. But dude, man, you guys are supposed to be protecting people. You're taking their chains? That was his last day. You was working in security, and you was about code check, man. You saw everything before it got inside. Whether you was a celebrity or you was just a regular Joe, you had to go past the code check. Code check at the tunnel is basically like the line to get in the tunnel. It's like another 3,000 people. That code check was like a whole nother income. I got to say, it was literally a gold mine. It was crazy if it was mandatory, because if it was mandatory, then that's a problem, because brothers didn't want to hang their coats up. Mandatory coat check, mandatory coat check. And there'll be cats out there with minks and fly shit, and I'm, I'm not going to check my coat and something happens to it, because on the front of the coat check, it says we're not responsible for certain things that happen with the coat. So F that, I am not checking my mink. You're checking your coat at the tunnel. There's no way you get to rock your shit at the tunnel unless you were respected by the, 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 the bouncers and everybody at that front. You might be on that line to check your coat for like half hour, 45 minutes. Checking your coat was good, but getting your coat out afterwards, woo! When it's time you pick your coat up, all hell is breaking loose. Shout out to every chicken head that had a fight at the coat check. You used to make all nights. I never really checked my coat, but when I did check my coat, though, a couple of times, I left my coat there. 
wasn't even worth it, baby. You, know, you could always make a little extra dollar or two. <laughs> you know, yo, get my coat for me, man. It's 20 hours. It's 50 hours. I'm going to keep it real. You better know the right people, because if you came in here coat checking Pele's and furs and all that, and you didn't ring bells, whoo, bye-bye. Leave a mink, come back and get a hoodie. Sometimes the bloops happen where you might not get your coat, or you might get somebody else's coat. Sometimes coats went missing because people would find coat check tickets on the floor and claim people's things that weren't theirs. I remember motherfuckers would jump over the counter and start stealing coats. More shit was happening then than the shit that was happening on the fucking dance floor. A lot of fights broke out after coat check. A lot of minks got stolen. <laughs> coat check was no good. I seen him give a bitch fur coat away. And she was crying. She was like, my brother gonna come down here. I swear to God, yo, the bitch was in tears. Word the mother. She's like, yo, no, I want my fucking coat. She's like, girlfriend, it's not gonna work tonight. You fucked up. The hangar there with the ticket, but there's no coat. Uh, you know, so a lot of times when they started wearing their furs, they wouldn't check their furs. You know, we had to put up little signs, check at your own risk. That means, look, you never know. I, I mean, a lot of boys wanted to get their girls some fur coats, you know, so I mean, it was free. Do not put your shit in coat checks. We lost many eight ball jackets up in there. I left my coat in the car. Ain't nobody did the coat checks. I'm from the hood, we don't check our coats. I never took my coat off. I used to have my duchess in that bitch. I never wore a coat in there because it was the worst. <laughs> I put my coat in the booth. My coat check was the booth. We stuffed our coats in our bags or we never even had to give up a coat. Never used a coat check ever, ever, ever. You could really just come out there on a cold winter night and, and, and be going home to the train station with no coat, no nothing. And no explanation, no, I'm going to reimburse you. No, we got you. Oh, I know who got No, we gave your shit to homeboy. He said it was his. What you going to do? Who thinks that you have to have 17 security guards to watch the fucking coat check at the end of the night. But when you got over 2,000 people in there talking about, nah, I'm not waiting because they're drunk or they're thugs or frankly, if they're drug dealers or from a team of guys or just any 10 or 15 guys who figure, fuck that, I'm not waiting. You got to have a strong team there. You got a bunch of drunken knuckleheads at the end of the night. You know, that's what you got to deal with. <laughs> The bar, the big money maker, the bar. This upstairs bar was in the middle of the unisex double bathroom. You sitting up there drinking, waiting for all the chicks to come upstairs on that high heel shit. We had a bar in the back area that had anywhere from four to five bartenders. And we had a little back bar area once you stepped out of the uh, bathroom area that had maybe two or three bartenders. And each one of those bars did unbelievable business. Now the bar downstairs connected to the booth, that was just pure madness, man. It was the longest bar I've ever seen in my life. A 360 degree, I want to, it's not even a circle, like a rectangle, and it's just like, bam, smack in the middle of the club. It used to be set up kind of like how the boroughs are connected because on one side you had Queens, then you had Uptown and the Bronx, and then on the other side you had Brooklyn. So it's kind of set up like how the city was. There's the front part of the bar when I was closest to the pictures and the cameras and stuff. It was really, really chilled out over there. Then you had the, the other side of the bar, which was away from the coat check. That's where it was all clicked up. If you, if you wasn't even supposed to be over there, you didn't even go over there. We had a wall on the tunnel. You had the DJ booth, you had the bar. That wall was a lot of history. A lot of deals got made. A lot of shit got popped off. A lot of money changed hands right there on that wall by the bar. That's where we chilled. Everyone stood there, the best of the best, artists, the guys that were making the money. That side of the bar was all the industry cats. If you come in and, and you go straight to the right, that bar was all the killers, all the killers and all the gangsters. So the industry cats, you didn't belong on that side of the wall. Like I said, it was like, it was like you was in jail. So if you're on the wrong side of the bar, something gonna happen. That's the meeting spot right there whether you bought a drink or not. That was when the bar was the bar. The bar used to be hectic, like a thousand people at the bar. You stand there, you stand there, you stand there. And it was so hard to get to the bar because that was like the lounge. You either have people spending lots of money or you have the motherfuckers standing there looking and trying to get a 
free glass of water. Why the tunnel lines too long? I, I, I got drunk before I got there. We would try to get as many drinks as we can at one time. I'm double fisted because I'm not going back to that bar and waiting 30, 40 minutes. Every alcohol that was ever sold was there was sold out. Yeah, everybody from every borough had their own preference of what they were drinking. I want to know what niggas in New York like to drink. <laughs> That was Incredible Hulk times. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That was the drink of choice back then. Incredible Hulk? Incredible Hulk. That's what we used to rock. That was absolutely my drink. For like two years, that's all I drank. Thug, Passion, the Hennessy. Especially when they came out with the Red Alizé. Your Remy Red Alizé. Hennessy. Henny first, then we converted to Gavassier. Henny. Straight Hennessy. Colleagues used to be Bex. I was Jack Daniels. Remy and Alizé, but Remy. Double shots of Remy, baby. Shout out to Patrick, you already know. Patrick, every week, my boys, we was all good. Bottles was super cheap <laughs> all night. He the homie. Some nights we would sell out of champagne. We'd have to drive over to Jersey to get more champagne. That's how busy it would be. Anytime there were big crews inside, each member of the crew would have a bottle of champagne. If they saw another crew, they would send an entire crew bottles of champagne. That's the original Buying out the ball spot. I can't even say a handful of niggas buy out the tunnel ball. We would always open the bar. Now, when I mean open the bar, the bar would be open for an hour on us. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's David John from FUBU and this motherfucker is hot tonight. Yeah. For real. We're going to show the SM OOP Dr. Dre exhibit how East Coast niggas do it. You ain't never going to see no designer do the shit we about to do. If you ever been to our parties, you know how we set it off. I'm going to get it all loosened up for y'all fellas in here. Cause I'ma open the motherfucking bar for all the ladies. Word up, oh, the bar is now open for all the motherfucking ladies. Free drinks on food, food, baby. Yeah, I remember LL came in one night, bought out the bar, like 25 grand, whatever. Cause he was supposed to perform, or everybody expected him to perform. He's like, nah, and he just compensated, I guess, by buying out the bar. Everybody in the club can drink with their bar for an hour. Drinks is on L. Let's get down, baby. Puff and just a whole bunch of dudes that's just from the hood would buy that bar out. We did it because we were giving back to the people. I paid 50 bucks for a jar of orange juice, for a, for a craft of orange juice, 50 bucks. I was like, look, I was with my people. I got like three bottles. And the thing about also too, there was no bar. Let's go to the, let's go sit in our section. You, your section was that little carved out spot at the bar and you had to have at least a couple people guarding your bottles. Well, that bottle service nonsense today, I mean, that's a different story. Nah, it was no such thing about a sparkler. If you have one or two bottles and the sparks flying, the shit looks stupid as hell if you ask me. The bar was, was always beautiful. It's just that um, some nights you got it good, some nights you didn't. You might get fake alcohol. The bartenders might have got counterfeit. They would charge extra money on Sunday nights because people wouldn't uh, tip. So they had to add a tip to the price. Easily every night, man, they'd clear about 150 grand cash at that bar or better. <laughs> the dance floor was crazy, man. Massive ass fucking space, you know, and it would just be filled with just people vibing and, and being controlled by the music. When the tunnel first opened, it was a train station. So you had two sidewalks and you had an area that was actually recessed downward. Peter took wood and built right over that recessed area. So every time you stepped on the dance floor, it had a little play to it. It would bounce, it would go up and down. So anytime the DJ was spinning music, especially if it had a strong bass, you would feel it in the floor. The floor literally moved. I thought the floor was moving up and down like this one point, it was so crazy one night. It was one of the biggest dance floors I've ever seen. The dance floor is always rocking. It looked like a video all the time. All you saw was a sea of people moving, just going like this. And the deeper you went, pause back up in there, the more gutter it got. A lot of security used to be scared to walk on that dance floor. The dance floor in the tunnel was a war zone. The night we had Nori and Cameron, they surrounded my niece and robbed her. Well, her jury. Niggas was back there fucking. Niggas is back there selling weed. Niggas is back there gang banging. One of the biggest battlefields ever. Cause a nigga might just be dancing on the dance floor with a nigga bitching and a nigga don't even know it. You might just turn around and your whole back is slit. For me, the dance floor was a spot where I would go and film a lot. Walk through the crowd, 
Which, when I think about it now, it was kind of ballsy of me, thinking about all the gangsters and thugs and gangbangers and everything that was in the crowd, me just running up on dudes with the camera, with the bright light in their face. I'm surprised nobody ever tried to crack my head back then. So as you came into the dance floor and the music started pumping, it would just go around and like almost like a skating ring kind of a circle. You throw on something like M.O.P., Annie Up, guarantee somebody get robbed. <laughs> a banger come on, you, you just you just know to hit the wall and just watch how the club starts moving and how the club starts shifting. When you know it starts shifting and you, people can't control their balance, you know niggas is getting robbed and you watch the robbers. Nine out of 10 times we knew who was gonna rob. You feel me? Cause you can just sit back and watch and they come in with that click, we know them. We bang into them every week. We watch them, after we watch them, we go home smiling. You may not catch the fight, but you'll know that there's the fight by the, the crowd moving, that whole wave of crowd. We're not talking about, oh, it's 10 or 15 people moving. We're talking about like 250 people moving at once. Watching Alpha and Bolo, because when they spot something in the crowd, they diving in and we going right to it. I used to stand on top of a speaker and just play the wall. Sit, jump off, you run to it. Some of y'all used to run from it. I'm standing like on a step or so, just looking at the dance floor. And I see the crowd just moving like waves, like fish in the ocean. All of a sudden, one guy pops up and it's him and his crew fighting in there. I'm like, yo, what are you doing, man? Just having fun. And he dives back in and the crowd is doing this. A lot of the older dudes really just stayed up by the bar all the young wild niggas stayed up on the dance floor. But I felt like that's where the newbies went. I would never go in there. And when ain't nothing happen, you really seen a party. I like going over to the back, because in the back you can kind of like, you know, a little more private in the back on the dance floor. You know, you might catch a girl booed up with your favorite rapper. Yeah, you see dance. bitches doing a dance from the, the Nino Brown shit. You like, oh my gosh. This shit is real. You had certain cats that played the dance floor all night. They just came up for water and headed straight back there like it was a porn video. Cause when the right song come on, you got motherfuckers, I mean legs on the motherfucking shoulder. A lot of side action on the side and the speakers and all that. And you see a chick, she got a skirt up. Now you trip over a girl's feet cause she on her knees. Yeah, I've seen people having sex on the dance floor. I saw my first homo thug couple make out on the dance floor. <laughs> Women in cages. We would just look from the sidelines and look at people just sweating and getting it in. You find in that tunnel some of the best dances. The video dancers, they came there to let loose. They came there to battle each other. A serious circle, meaning it was a certain people that would be dancing at that time with the mop tops, misfits. These are cool dancers that, that ran the whole club scene at that time. All around the side of the dance floor, you had all of the stick-up boys, the grimy niggas, niggas just came home. I used to run in there with the older guys from my hood. You know, on some, they was on some stick-up shit. I was a little homie at that time. And even though it was so much thuggery going on in the spot, you would see niggas was enjoying themselves, smiling and having a good time. Back then, at the time, it was so much music, dope music. Yeah, when the Remy's in the system, ain't no telling, will I fuck him, will I kiss him? Niggas is mad, they get more fun than ashtrays. Stop, drop, shut them down, open up, shut. Do you really want to party with me? Let me see this what you got for me. It ain't premiere. God damn, when them tracks come on, Woo! One of the dopest things about the tunnel for me to remember is hearing my records get played up in there. You know, that's a big deal. And seeing everybody go, oh! The top, maybe, of all time tunnel banger. The Benjamins by Diddy and the Family. That record rocked for two years straight. The number one banger in the tunnel was the Benjamin. That record reigned supreme for a long time. You know, Buster came with uh, Put Your Hands With My Eyes To See. Man, Buster used to have that shit lit in the tunnel. Well, anything bad, boy. Every Biggie record. That Biggie banged in the tunnel for Brooklyn every week. Any Biggie. Real Love Remix. Ten Crack Commandments was like danger in that bitch. They put on Big, the tunnel would just almost flip upside down. Where Brooklyn at, Biggie and Tupac? Hypnotized. So I'm in the tunnel, and um, Dreams is playing, and I'm standing next to Patra. Biggie goes, something, something for Patra. Patra's like this. Big Papa. Craig Mack. Black Rob. Whoa. 
any shit by whole Jay-Z joint. Like, boom, boom, boom. That was kind of bananas in there. Nigga what, nigga who? That 2 a.m. up in the club. Where I'm from, Marcy saw Anything Rockefeller, if it was Jay-Z or Beanie, or Beanie Siegel or Freeway Record. It was another level when The Rock came on. Memphis Bleak, Mind Right was big in the tunnel. Nori Kapoom, that bang bang. Little Kim was popping at that time. No time, Little Kim. So Little Kim came out with the gangster rap, forget about the girls were throwing singles and moving like guys. I'm like, look at this shit. Little Kim, Big Mama thing. Master P bout it, bout it. Used to tear the roof. All the big time is joined. The locks. Anything locks. While I would actually start a fight. Niggas done started something. I know we motherfucking ripped the tunnel to shreds. When Cream came on, that was a money-maker song. There's so many damn songs. That dog. DMX shit, it would just be like, ah. Get at me, dog, might be like number one, or at least got to be like number two when that, boom. <laughs> get at me, dog. Boy, that was like tunnel, like, whoa. M.O.P. Number one tunnel beggars, Andy up. Yo, when M.O.P. used to come on, even for me, I used to be like, yes! Some of that boot camp clip. Throw your guns in the air. Onyx was, oh my god. See murder down for my nigga. One for all. That brand Nubian record. The Rock Wild by Method Man. I used to love the way that sounds. Mob Deep, Shook Ones. Mm. Shook Ones? Woohoo! You lose character up in there. That's when you might just get your shit snatched. Shook Ones was bananas in there. <laughs> Put a hood on it. Quiet Star was number one in here. Nas, hate me now. I got Akinelli. Put it in your mouth. Man, you know, a lot of the West Coast stuff was, was popping also. Snoop Dogg, that like gin and juice record. Hail Mary, you know, Dear Mama. Pop that coochie. That was the song in the tunnel. The one I hated the most, but it was a good song in the tunnel, was the water dance. Flex used to always want to play that shit when we was picking the money up. And that shit used to have the crowd going bananas. Him, let me know. Mace, horse and carriage. Brave horse, hoochie, wally. And at any moment, you was like right there with your favorite rapper. So, you know, it was kind of like, what's up? Your song is nice. Yeah, let's dance to it. Up in the tunnel. The unisex bathroom was uh, a mind child of a, a promoter named uh, I'm trying to remember, I think his name was Cheech. And he said, when he was in Europe, it was a big thing, the unisex bathrooms. And you, he said, no one felt uncomfortable. Yeah, they had all like neon blue lights in there, and it was all white marble tiles. It was crazy, that bathroom. Bathroom at the tunnel had a bar in the middle of it, and there was guys on one side, girls on the other, and they would mix and roll through. They had benches in the bathroom where you actually could sit on one side of the bathroom. A DJ in there. Music banging. People smoking weed, people sniffing coke. You walked in there, you took your piss, and you got out of there. You better go in and come out quick. Better hope that you can get a <laughs> thaw without being looked at. For me, it was uncomfortable. I never went to the urinal. A chick would walk over, let me see what you're working with. As soon as I went in there, I was like this, looking, trying to look past the dudes like when they was going in the urinal. Men and women going to the bathroom, like it was crazy. I hated going to the bathroom. I, I never would go to the bathroom. So the average black woman ain't used to using the bathroom with a man standing right there. You went in and took a piss while there was a woman standing there washing her hands. Or you went in there and took a shit if you were stupid enough and there was a woman sitting next to you talking about, yo, you got toilet paper? I mean, it was constant. Sometimes that shit was the nastiest shit in the world. Sometimes it was the best shit in the world. Cause you'll go to the men's bathroom and you'll see some fucking Kotex and bloody shit on the floor. You're like, yo, what the fuck is this? One time there was a woman in there. She had a dress on, she changing her pad. She just took out the dirty one, got the fresh one in the other hand. You, this nigga come in there talking about, yo, what's good, let's pop. You know we had to beat his ass. And it was kind of crazy because the bathroom was up out of the way and most of the security was down on the dance floor. When it got crazy, we had to run from the dance floor all the way up the stairs. So by the time we got up there, there was no talking. If you was up there and you was fucking around, you had to go. So it was cats that came to the tunnel and they went up in the bathroom area and they never came downstairs, only for showtime. Sometimes you just go to the bathroom when it's just not nothing happening where you at right then. Because you know something going to be walking in, something going to be walking out. The way it was set up, it wasn't like it was It was nasty like that because the bathroom and the toilets and the urinal was all on the whole 
like another little side, so it was nothing you smelling, nothing. People came, you know, make money. The gun deals, the drug deals, the prostitution deals. Every once in a while I get a call, listen, the ladies are conducting business upstairs. So I said, okay, let me go check out. Sure enough, they'd be in there conducting their businesses, hit you off with 20%, and for what I could see, they weren't hitting me off with 20%, look more like 2%. If you didn't want to get put out, you got to pay. It was a hotel. What, short stay, $35. And some things used to go down in the bathroom. <laughs> we had nice times at the tunnel, you know what I'm saying? Using the bathroom. I also had to go up there and extract people from the toilets because we had what I call bath bathroom stall chicks on nights you didn't want to get caught. But um, it was different. That was kind of like the only club in New York that had the unisex bathroom, so you know. Sometimes you knew that the cutie was going to the bathroom, and sometimes the guy be waiting for you to come out the bathroom. So it was kind of like, yeah, that was his own pickup spot. Every time I was like, hey, get out, get out, get out. You see the legs up, the panties down, <laughs> girls on their knees. Is hey, what you doing? We're almost. She's done. She's almost done. Come on, give her a minute. Have I ever got picked up at the bathroom? I mean, I picked up my lipstick off the floor, but that's all I'ma say. This dude was banging this chick out so crazy. Next thing you know, he popped out with her and she fell on the floor and he was on top of her. I was like, wow. I would look down at the floor and I see four pair of feet like. And Karuchi caught me in the back smashing like this one. Nigga said, oh shit, I'm back there smashing while the party. The, a lot of babies was made from the tunnel. Just leave it like that. Just, just a lot of you niggas is babies from the tunnel. That bathroom done seen some history. Shasta Nelly, that bathroom done seen some history. Oh, my bad, Shasta Ja Rule. We used to go in there because we knew the girls was in there, so we'd like to hang out to see who, who, see who, who would notice us. Shasta Bow Wow and that big booty Puerto Rican chick from Newark, New Jersey, by Broad Street in the projects. You know who I'm talking about. You know what you did with Bow Wow. Why you gonna rape that little nigga? Backstage is like the club amongst the club, amongst friends, and you you see a little bit of everything back there too. It's only a few people can really get back there. Backstage is where we did all our interviews. Since like you ain't on no limit no more. What's the pros and cons of that? Shit. It got it got it got motherfucking both pros and cons. Cause when I was born with no limit, that was a motherfucking mass unit, you know. But the pros to it is, you know, I get I get more attention out to my individual self, but that ain't always cool all the time, you know what I'm saying? But it's right now, perfect. What's up, Cormega? Chillin', chillin', what's the deal? Alright, so now let's touch on your album. When is that coming out and what can we look for? The album coming out like within three, four months, like four months. And you can look for a lot of rappers that lose their jobs when my shit come out. Because I'm real with my shit. A lot of rappers is repping thugs, so I can't even rep thugs no more. I'm gonna let them keep that. I'm repping gangsters. So, you know, you're just gonna keep it gangster. And if you were backstage, man, chances are you got to experience what hip hop life and hip hop culture and being around hip hop artists was really about. Backstage at the tunnel was always a locked situation. What happens backstage is mostly for the artists that were going to perform that night or the artists coming in that did not want to be too much in the crowd. I'm gonna keep it 100. That's where all the so-called stars who was scary to be in the crowd, that's where they hung out at. I remember we had next, one of the ones to go use the bathroom. He was like, I used the bathroom. I was like, it was over there. He was like, I gotta walk through that crowd. I said, yes, you do, nigga, you gonna be pissy. Nobody was on a high horse at the time. Like now, backstage, you probably have a lot of people that got their heads up high. Back then, it wasn't like that. You know what I'm saying, nigga, it was still on the grind. So it was like a family atmosphere for a long time in there, man. I mean, niggas got their head busted, but it was family fight. That was back there one night punning with, I think, one of the Rod's Reefs people would have helped. This little short black cat walking around talking about sex, money, and drugs. Woo, 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 woo. Yo, all these German niggas in here. Pun got up. Pun for a big dude? He got up off that couch, yo. I remember that. His face got serious. And I was like, OK, OK, my man. They should have put him on the Giants or something. Took off his chain. Grabbed the medallion. He whipped it, nigga ass. He backed up like that about 
eight terror squad niggas started pounding on him. Bam, bam, bam. And he was about to leave the building, but Peter Guns made him come back in the building because he want, they wanted to get that paper. I seen Latifah while I remember Brat was drunk. They had to grab my ass backstage. Jay-Z bodyguard tried to stop me from going backstage. At my own party, my own show. Like, I was head of security. You're going to tell me, oh, you can't come back here. Jay's back here, bitch, shut off. He almost got 86. We had Snoop out here. Snoop had like five charter buses out here full of quips and everybody that was down with death row at the time and we had to deal with that backstage. The backstage at the tunnel was where everybody wanted to be at because not only did we have all the hottest MCs, all the hottest rappers up and coming or very relevant at the time was backstage with the entourage, all the ladies, all the all the hangers on, everybody wanted to get back there because they were either shopping their music or trying to get into be part of the clique or be part of the entourage. Half of New York City, the women that used to go to clubs, especially during the tunnel days, you can say what you want, I don't care what kind of job, what kind of title you hold, you was a groupie. Because then everybody that came here then got New York head from whatever, wherever they come, wherever they came from. I know Nelly did. I know Luda did. You ready? You ready to fucking sink or swim? That's what, that's the conversations that went down back there. Like, look, nigga, this ain't no fucking bullshit. This is straight, grimy, hood, hip hop niggas. If you ain't going up there to rock, don't go on that stage. You know, everybody want to be on stage. That's my boy. You know, okay, we need one hype man. You need whoever's performing. We don't need all of this up here. The tunnel was one of the only clubs in New York where you didn't really want to get backstage because everything was popping so much, you know, in the crowd by the bar. God bless the dead. Biggie was my man. Biggie and him at the bar. LL Cool J with the red mink on at the bar giving out um, shots of Alizé with the FUBU dudes. Maybe now that's backstage the best place, but the tunnel, outside, that's where all the action was. I'm tired of niggas always talking about the guns they burst. Nigga, please, you only squeeze December the 31st. The time round by the level 45 is the only time lad come out to 45. The best performance I've ever seen, Jay-Z performed in front of the DJ booth. When Hard Knock Life came on, the DJ booth was bouncing like a ball. First of all, I want y'all to know tonight, right? If anybody ever been to the tunnel, y'all know, Niggas usually perform back there somewhere they make a stage and all that shit. They ain't wanna make a stage for me. They said if I perform it, it caused a riot. And I ain't being biased, it was Jay-Z. When this nigga came on, yo, and the nigga said, all the busters, y'all got five seconds, pop. All you see, a nigga shit start leaking. They were winding that shit back. Give me that shit again, Scratch. By the way, we run this shit. Drop that shit for me, Scratch. So Jay was like, yo, we not doing none of the radio shit. I can't remember how I started the show, but I think I was saying like, uh... And for all the little youngins in here, Jack came here to hear... Hard Knock Life. It's not going down like that. Y'all in the wrong motherfucking place tonight. I was just naming all big radio records Jay had. But if y'all came in here to hear... And then I threw on something. I can't remember which record I threw on, but I threw on some gritty Jay-Z shit, and that's how we started the show. Jermaine Dupree and Jay-Z. Punch album release party. The best performance at the tunnel for me, hands down, is Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg. If I have to go at one, when the West Coast invaded the tunnel. Snoop and Dre. When Dre was there. Snoop Dogg and the whole death row. When Snoop and Dre got on that stage and they saw the love that they had got from all these East Coast, they couldn't believe it. I never thought I'd see them in the tunnel. Can I eat this shit? If you want to say smoke that shit. Look here, if the police come up here and try to arrest me, which one of y'all motherfuckers gonna fuck them up? Somebody say, fuck the police! Say, fuck the police! He's my kind of niggas right here, bro.
Oh, Nate Dogg was on stage with them too. That DMX performance at the tunnel was my best. DMX, get at me, dog. DMX, get at me, dog. We went up to $100 that night at the door. Diddy and the family. The best performance was in Nas. Nas. Nas came in here and did his thing. God, son. I'm gonna stay Buster, man. Buster used to just tear that shit down. He always had that energy. He just knew Buster was gonna be a star. Timberland came and he bought a Leah, Jane Wine. I remember the atmosphere just being crazy. I remember everybody in the joint packed crazy. Everybody's just there supporting. I love the tunnel, man. Onyx. Onyx in the tunnel was crazy. We did the tunnel. Shreds. You hear me? Get that shit off. And I'm just gonna put you on my name to that. What's up, man? He did our thing in there a couple of times too. Naughty by nature, they rocked it when they were there. My uncle Luke had a show in there. Luke tore it down. Savant. The Fuji's. Pony Noriega. Red and Meth. Andre 3000. I was there for 55th debut, he came through. Everybody was looking at him like, hey, who this little nigga? Put your motherfucking hands up, one time. Put your motherfucking hands up. Now say, do that shit, do that shit, do what? Yo, yo, get the bass. I say, do that shit, do that shit, do what? Now if you all about the cash and making money fast, say, oh. King of the Tunnel record label wise was Def Jam. Def Jam had the biggest roster back then. Bad boy. Bad boy. I used to always see Def Jam street team outside with the picket sticks up there. Them motherfuckers was in full force. Bad boy and Rough Rider. Say Bad Boy and Def Jam. Loud records back then. I would say loud. Bad boy. Uh, label wise? Yeah. Rockefeller would be the king. And they were all coming with bangers. They said Beans was hot, Bleak was hot, Freeway was hot, Jay's hot. They had that much catalog that you couldn't deny. Obviously, Bad Boy. Def Jam. Rockefeller. Def Jam. The label that represented the most in the tunnel is Bad Boy. Rough Rider. Nervous Records. Def Jam. Bad Boy. Def Jam had the most artists at the time. You would have to say them. Then they're like the Bad Boy era. Rough Rider era. I had to be bad boy. Puff was like a, a genius of promotion. I remember Tinker and everybody else, they used to have motherfucking post signs out and shit. Bad boy, bad boy. Rough Riders and bad boy. Well, there was only two labels that ran the tunnel and that was, I'm mean, gonna keep it 100. There's only one label, that was Bad Boy Entertainment. It went from Bad Boy, then Biggie passed away, and then Jay came through, so five men, and then XO four men and Ja Rule so four men. Def Jam was definitely king of the tunnel. Def Jam was always a label, but it was a, it was different because it was a major label with a shitload of artists and a bunch of different types of people. It wasn't lifestyle like Bad Boy was lifestyle. The label that had the strongest presence in the tunnel is the label that been having the strongest presence in hip hop, and that's Def Jam. Bottom line, you know, respect to. Death Row, respect to Bad Boys, respect to all these other independent labels as well as majors. But when you see that stamp, Def Jam, from the LL Cool J ever later on, it's significant that they had the mean roster. And whoever came from that roster, they made it happen, which is the reason why a person like Flex got signed to Def Jam to put out what you call the album at that time, or CD later on, called The Tunnel. King of the Tunnel. The King of the Tunnel is a lot of people. Whoa. That's, that's a hard one. Um, whoa, that's a hard one, because well, I think B.I.G. I would say Biggie first. The King of the Tunnel? Shit, Jay probably broke the record up in there, like Bruce Springsteen at the Garden and Paul McCartney. The run that is how many times you done wrecked it, and Jay probably done been up in there more than any goddamn body. Oh, Jay-Z. Biggie was there every motherfucking week, man. Smoking, drinking. I think Big was a tunnel until we lost him. I can't really say anybody was really the king of that building. Snoop came through the building, he shut it down. Jay came through the building, he shut it down. King of the tunnel was a toss up between Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Jay-Z. I want to say Jay-Z, 
but it wouldn't be fair just to say him because Fat Joe was probably the one that came and always held us down. Queensbridge coming there with heavy behind Nas. Locks may come down there heavy from Yonkers. You take DMX and Nas. Like Jay-Z or Biggie or DMX. Yeah, like the tunnel was crowded every Sunday. But when Jay came in there, it was a whole nother level. Jay-Z, oh my God, when Jay-Z was coming, that was it. The king of the tunnel was Jay-Z, hands down. Every time we had him, the police would be outside. You got five minutes to get him off the stage if we coming in. That's never happened for no other artist in that building. Get into the X-Man, the Dark Man, yeah. That was Biggie. And you could throw Busta Rhymes in there, too. The king of the tunnel had to be Jay-Z, because he was consistent. You remember, he always said it, Jig has held you down six summers, ways of love. Big smashed the motherfucking tunnel up, heavy. Jay smashed the tunnel up. Niggas can't find them Yonkers niggas, though. Rough Riders came through there and smashed that motherfucker up. King of the Tunnel for me would be the DJ himself. Nobody. Damn, Queen of the Skins. The queen of the Tunnel? Man, it gotta be Lil' Kim, man. Between her and Foxy. Fox and Kim. I would put it between both of them, Foxy and Lil' Kim. Back then, it was Lil' Kim. That was definitely Lil' Kim. She was on her shit at that time. Foxy was moving, but Queen was the queen. I think maybe Foxy got it. Cause Fox would come through a little harder. Kim had the army behind him. They was both in there on like they was niggas, man. Even Queen Penn was in there doing her thing. Queen Penn did her thing in there. Queen Penn was running it for a minute. Mary J. Blige. The obvious music-wise, I would say Little Kim between her and Foxy. When it came to touching the stage, I never seen Little Kim rip the tunnel stage. I never seen Foxy rip the tunnel stage. With music play and ripping the stage, it would be Eve. I think I might have saw Eve more in the tunnel than Kim, so I would say Eve. I would say that's a good argument because Eve had a lot of heat out at that time too. It probably would have been Eve. Probably got to get that shit to Lil' Kim. Eve was hot, she was smoking, but Queen B. There is no other queen when it comes to that. That's her building. Best DJ in the tunnel, I would have to say. Kid Capri used to come through there and shake it. Clark Kent used to come through there and shake it. Chuck Chillout used to come through there and shake it. A lot of cats came through there and shook it. Oh, well, that goes without saying. <laughs> Who's the best DJ at the tunnel? Was this a, a trick question? I was the best DJ at the tunnel. The best DJ at the tunnel was Flex. Big cap, all day. Flex used to break off the records, but he used to try to bully cap, like, don't spin this, because when I get here, I want to spin it. No, nigga, fuck wrong with you. And then it was a lot of times I played joints that was hot, and then Flex would come in there and hear him, and then he'd be like, yo, don't play, I'm going to play that. I'm gonna start playing that joint. I'll be like, yo, go ahead. I got a million of them. Fumble King? He was a fumble king sometime, I ain't gonna lie. Flex used to fucking fumble like a motherfucker. I like how Cap played because Cap will warm you up with a good R&B set. You know what I'm saying? Or he played a lot of joints that Flex didn't or wouldn't play. <laughs> And I was fortunate enough to do the B.I.B. out with Little John. And I remember, and I'm playing this song, and Flex was like, yo, this is not going to pop. This is not hot. But I know when I'm out of town, and I'm getting, I'm running with Little John, and the joint is banging, but you know, New York was slow on a Southern record. And then that joint popped off, became one of the biggest records. And then not for nothing, I was the first New York DJ to start playing southern music, south music in the clubs, and I started playing it in the tunnel. Them niggas that was before Flex used to have that shit popping big time. They was the reason I came. I was in charge of setting you up and getting you right and getting you bouncing and making you bounce and keeping you going. I was the new and improved version of Funkmaster Flex. Cap would start him up. You may have skipped a couple records. Still love you, Cap. <laughs> <laughs> but Flex. I'm going to say Flex is the best DJ. The star of the show, the funk, not the Flex. I'm going to say Big Cab and Flex. I can't think of any other DJs but Johnny Walker, Red, Cap, and Flex. Ooh, holy shit, fucking Johnny. Yo, Johnny used to have that shit popping. Johnny Walker. <laughs> I forgot about fucking, yes. Yo, Johnny fuck, I don't think nobody even knew. That's when I was walking in the spot, when Johnny was on the motherfucking set. That nigga was having this shit. I was walking in there dancing like that. 
The best DJ at the tunnel besides me, well, I mean, you gotta give it to Flex, man. Like, yo, he made that crowd almost push bricks out of the building. Best DJ was Flex. Flex. That was Flex's pet. Nobody's messing with his pet. Flex. That's the house that Flex built. Kid Capri was definitely one dude that, that I would say was the best DJ. Outside of me, Flex was the only one I seen in Rocket. The best guest DJ at the tunnel was Jermaine Dupri. Funk Master Flex. It's gotta be Flex. There wouldn't be a tunnel without Funk Master Flex. My partner, Cat, yo. Big Cat was terrorizing. It was a setup, the way he did it. We had Johnny Walker Red, he opened. He played all the Mary and all the nice R&B. Then you had Cap come on. He warmed it up. He's playing the gritty. And then Flex. Flex is playing all the hits all night. Flex is to the tunnel around the rest of the DJs like Michael Jordan is to the Bulls. But who was the best? I can't say in judgment. Because sometimes you may have one that had a better night than the other. You know, it may be a night that the opener may set the tone so strong that the finisher may not be as strong as the opener and then it may be vice versa. So it's hard to say, you know? And no, 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 I'm not trying to be politically correct on this. <laughs> I'm just telling the truth, because I had bad nights myself. Hello, Flex. Come back to style, Flex. Compliment to my nigga, I'm Daddy. What? Now, don't fuck Flex coming out with his solo album, two on all records. It's gonna be ill. Big Cat got his shit on Universal Records, and then we come in all back again to do it again to Tunnel Part 2 on Def Jam Records, nigga. You good, baby? You good? Let's do it. Yeah, baby. My nigga. There was a one time there was a shootout in a tunnel. Yo, niggas started busting guns. The place was going nuts, and Mark Murray said, go in there and tell Flex to start playing some ladies' tunes and tone it down. And as I run in there to get in the DJ booth, boom, 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 boom. Some niggas started shooting. Shots are fired up against the brick wall right near the main bar. I'm seeing the niggas shooting. They rushing everybody out. This nigga go run out. Big Cap grabbed me. We all went down under the booth. Shootouts, fights, everything happened in the motherfucking tunnel. Like, it was just crazy, but we still came back. I don't know why, but we did. We loved it. It was fucking crazy. It was incredible. I've seen a lot of people get busy, you know. I'm going to say I know my man Nori and them used to regulate, and I know we used to regulate. Nori had you poem. Every time they in the building, something jumping off the murder unit, nigga. In the tunnel, I seen rappers get smacked, like, literally, like, by niggas that was like, son, I don't give a fuck who you are. What tie, whole lot. Get the fuck out of here. I don't fuck you make records, nigga. Like, man, I seen, <laughs> I seen niggas get chased around the tunnel, my nigga. Like, oh my gosh, yo. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna pull niggas, I ain't gonna put niggas on front street like that. Puff came in there, thought he was big man. Da, da, da. My man Tyson came through. Excitement got that on tape. That nigga ran out the DJ booth like a bitch. Took off like motherfucking Carl Lewis. Everybody wanted to get that Diddy. Diddy was fly. You know they wanted to get it. It wasn't even Diddy then, it was Puff. One's girl was with somebody. She was hanging out with some dude, man. They beat that nigga unconscious. I mean, they just jumped down on the stage and I mean, just put the boot to this nigga, man. I mean, he just, just stretched him out in the hallway and just left him. She's screaming, you know what I mean? Help him, we trying to help this nigga lifeless. I mean, they done beat the blood out. <laughs> he just stretched. I watched Marv Deep come off the stage performing and they man, the guard's son robbed him right at the bar because they didn't wait for him to come in with him. I beat up a couple of niggas in the tunnel. Statue of limitations is up on them crimes anyway. Yeah, niggas been poked up in all types of shit. He's walking out with stand, and this nigga bleeding on my shit, like. I'm laughing now because as I reminisce about it, you got me thinking about shit was really funny, but shit was really real and wicked. Freaky Ty, God bless the dead, man, but Freaky Ty, them niggas, used to, them niggas used to get it in, B. Lost Boys, I'm, I'm gonna move them to the top of the list because they used to get their asses whipped on the regular. Lost Boys, them niggas was just, yo, yeah, yeah. I've seen, I've actually seen Lost boys get thrown out the tunnel. Not meant to be trouble, you know what I'm saying? No. It's just we go deep, you know what I'm saying? We just wanted to get everybody in, you know, man. Them was the knucklehead niggas. 
kind of hard to control a bunch of dudes, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's hype, you know what I'm saying? We was LB fam, you know what I mean? We was, you know, we was doing the street team type thing. We just promoting, I don't know, man. But Wu, security and Wu used to get it in. Oh, ho, 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 ho. oh. what artists gave the tunnel security most problems? Wu-Tang Clan. One night, it was a night of the Source Awards. We had an all-out brawl with Wu-Tang. One dude cut O's arm, O was bleeding. O pulled out, pulled out his weapon, and um, he had one in the chamber. He tried to put another one in the chamber and jammed it. And that's, that's what saved that guy. Black Rob, man. Black Rob used to test security. We would always get into it with Anthony Mason, because, you know, he would come from the Knicks, you know, he played with the Knicks, you know, he had that paper, he'd come in there, get drunk. Thought he was wildebeest, and we had to put them paws up on him. The nigga Drez, alcoholic. I've seen him getting tossed out. I might got the most beef with securities on them days. My attitude was just horrible. A lot of beef is over chicks. My man P and Keith. I know both of them, so don't take no offense to this. Mob Deep did the, the second album, Infamous, and he had an acapella, or he had a talk about, yo, these rappers talking all that space shit. And then Keith Murray took it on his thing, like, yo, you talking about me? Cause I be talking that space shit. Then he seen him at the tunnel outside right around here. Put it on him, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know exactly what happened afterwards, but I know that Keith put it on Pete. You know what I'm saying? My job at the end of the night was to clean out the building, make sure all the security line up and make sure we clear the building out and then have everybody look over the building. Clear the bathroom first, that's upper level, down to the downstairs, go to the back of the tunnel where the stage was for the food, clear it all the way out to the coat check. Then we would come outside and we would have to clear the block from 12th Avenue to the 11th Avenue. Most of the time we had chicks waiting for us to get our bread and pack up them records. Was clean up all the records, put them back in a place, close them up, and take them home for the next event. So I would have to help all the other DJs carry their records out. Making sure my street team was at the male exit, the female exit, getting the email addresses, pass some flies out for the next week's event. As soon as the performance was over, and go right to the car and jet back to the Bronx. I would mark all the tapes, you know, who I shot, the interviews, whatever, pack up all the equipment. My exit at the tunnel, Get your coat, time to go. Going to security first and letting them say, yeah, go outside, no, don't go outside. Spin a club by one, two times. We used to have arguments with my girls. These bitches never want to fucking leave, so the exit was horrible. When the lights came on, nobody really moved. A lot of people didn't know that the tunnel had another room that was full of fur. It had four, fur on the floor. It had, you know, these funky little psychedelic couches and, and, and funky pictures, black light pictures on the wall. People were out of the tunnel and we were back there still partying. Are we gonna park in line pimp or are we gonna hurry up to get something to eat? So it all depends on, you know, who we're rolling out with and how many we're rolling out with and where you guys want to go. But it was never really home. You gotta go get to your car first, get your shit, clip it up, and get ready just in case the jackers wanna borrow something. You know, I knew all of the thuggers, you know what I'm saying? Cause I'm one of the main goons. So a lot of shit used to go on and sometimes you gotta turn your back. So my shit was, make sure I wasn't nowhere where I really didn't have to turn my back on somebody that I didn't really wanna turn my back on. When I left out of the tunnel, I prayed. You see big shit pull up right in front, he just hop right in and blunt lit. Police ain't saying shit, you know what I'm saying? They let niggas get it because they know niggas is about to leave. They all about to be all right. Loop around a couple times, smoke, hit the west side. Our ritual was stick together. Hopefully we park close. If we didn't park close to each other, we drive each other to each other's cars. Don't walk all the way up the block and not be a familiar face either, man. You had to walk 11th Avenue and turn the wrong corner, man. The Goonies was out there waiting, man, to catch the victims. I ain't gonna sit here and say I've seen a lot of niggas running back yelling help. You know what I mean? Don't know what happened to you, man, but look, man, you're running the wrong way. We off duty. For the end of the night, we probably sit around and, and count money because we made a lot of money out here. My ritual at the end of the night was to sit on the top of the stairs with a whole bunch of envelopes in my hand and calling off guys' names. And as I call up their name, they come get their money at the end of the night. If your name wasn't called and you worked and we ran into a fight and you sat there talking to a bitch and when we finished we came back with the with the perpetrators, 
and you were still there talking to the bitch, at the end of the night, you ain't have an envelope. Cause that shit was in my back motherfucking pocket and it wasn't a motherfucking thing you could do about it. If shit broke out you were, and you was in that area and you wasn't helping, you had to fight for that money at the end of the night. You wasn't just guy, I wasn't just gonna turn that money over to you. You had to put that work in. In front of everybody, some niggas wanted to fight, some niggas didn't want to fight. Some niggas went home without their paper. And some niggas decided, okay, listen, I at least got to step up for it. Oh, we hit in the corner, get some um, from Frank's and shit like that at the corner, you know? Shit's good all the sun like that. We either went to 23rd Street to the Chelsea Diner and got the motherfucking turkey burger, or we hit the bridge, you know what I'm saying? We hit the bridge and went to Brooklyn and stopped on Flatbush Avenue at the motherfucking Blimpies and got some motherfucking, got something to eat to soak up that liquor before we went to sleep. <laughs> If somebody, you know, had a couple dollars and took them to that diner, you know where the next stop was, right? Or should I say short stay? Closing a tunnel sucked. I mean, that shit broke my heart. That shit still hurt me till today. When I heard that it was getting to close down, I like, damn, it's always a dynasty. You ever come to an end? Oh my God, I was so sad. Took the tunnel away, like the fucking take the tunnel away. That shit was like a death in the family. I ain't been the same since. <laughs> it, it was like a crushing event for my life. The closing of the tunnel, it was kind of sad because that was a big piece of hip hop. Yo, losing the tunnel is like a little kid losing Disney. The closing of the tunnel is like a famous mosque closing down. It was like the hood ain't really have nowhere to go after that. I think when the tunnel closed, it was necessary. Niggas was coming to miss it. Just shooting and everything at the end and it was it was over stabbing outside and somebody got killed. I think it was time though man just because niggas was getting hurt, niggas was getting beat up, robbed. The dude that owned it, Peter Gation, he was already involved with a whole bunch of other stuff. That last night was like phew. I couldn't believe it. We was like, yo, it's over, man. It took away a piece of New York nightlife. A lot of people were just lost, period. Everybody dispersed with the different clubs. People moved up in the industry. It helped me become an independent entrepreneur by closing because, you know, the content that I created, the shows that we did there, it, it sharpened me as a, a producer and a director. And I was able to go on from there and do other television shows that ultimately winded me up at BET producing Rap City. For the mainstream general market population in New York City, limelight closing affected them. The Latin side of it, when the Copacabana was on 57th Street for all them years, you got to see all them beautiful performances and all of that from Mark Anthony on down. When they closed, that hurt a lot in that community. But I think in our era and in our time, when the tunnel closed, it, it, it closed a little bit of New York City. To me, it was like losing somebody. My baby moms I found here. It took a part of me away. Once they closed it down, you was like, damn, nigga. Might as well make it an NFL night all night. Your pocket changed, man, when the tunnel closed. After the tunnel was closed on Sunday, it's like, yo, wait a minute. I should have more money than this. If it didn't pay my whole mortgage, it paid a part of it. It fed a lot of security guys, bartenders, Bus boys, uh, the food people, you know what I'm saying? It fed the parking attendants. It fed a lot of people for years. Tunnel money put my son to college. And tunnel closing actually broke up a brotherhood. Once the heart left, it kind of felt like, you know, there's nowhere to go. All right, you gotta go fuck with these suckers at this club, this little white bitch with the clipboard who don't know who the fuck I am. It was the end of an era. It was like how when you hear people of the late 70s who went to Studio 54, talked about Studio 54, and, and they had their regulars and their celebrities. You know, the tunnel was the Studio 54 of hip hop. You couldn't do what you could do in the tunnel in any other club because they, they, they was in the wrong position in far as streets. The zoning laws was different. The police commissioners wasn't taken care of. The captains didn't like certain people. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and when that shit closed, man, it didn't affect me until I really realized that, yo, the fuck the tunnel closed, man? It's some bullshit. The tunnel they had a good run, man. You know, I mean, I forgot how many years it was, but it kept going because after what Jessica 
and Chris Lighty, rest in peace, have prevailed. Flex kept it running right after them and made it stretch out as long as he can. But you know what they say, good things all come to an end. Oh man, Big O, Big Otis. Big Otis, yes, God Big rest Otis. his soul. Yeah. Big Otis, Big Ant. Big Ant, God rest his soul. Big C, yes. Uh, Bub Bubba, which one, the Bubba one or Bubba two? Bubba. Which, which, I don't know Africa. which one. Africa, yeah. Wow. Big Troy. Big Troy. Big Troy. Mm. Wow. God rest his soul. Man. A lot of brothers. Man. Mm. Mm. Just to name a few. Just to name a few. Oh, um, hold on, hold on. I gotta think, man. Yeah, Big JC. Big JC. Bigger. Bigger pass? Big, big, yeah, big wow, I didn't even know that. Bez. Bez. Yeah, Bez. Oh, 